what is 1 plus 1? We know the answer is 2. We've been taught that in school. Yes, of course, there's two different numbers there. I, I know that. 1 plus 1 does not equal 1, Matt. What is wrong with your math here? <laughs> but here's the reality of this. And this may seem like a stupid example, but that's how a lot of us think about marriage, especially in our country. A lot of us think about marriage as 2. 1 plus 1 equals 2, and that's how we live. That's how we treat each other. That's how we interact. That's how we split up the bills. Even the idea of having a prenup is that kind of idea. Hey, if this thing doesn't work out, let's get everything squared away so that if this doesn't work out, we can have things straight, and you can have your stuff, and I can have mine. And you're going into it with the wrong motive. You don't have God's goal in mind. Now, that may not be y'all in here tonight, but that's an idea that the world pushes on us, and it wants to pull us in. So, we need to be reminded that marriage is God's covenant plan for one man and one woman to be made one together. That one plus one equals one. It's not two individuals treating each other well so they can get what they want. Tonight, we're going to be discussing that idea and discussing what the world is throwing at us and what God wants to guide us into and really focus in on why one plus one equals one. And this is the best way for marriage, not just from a practical standpoint, but from a God-worshiping and God-honoring standpoint. And I don't know if anybody in here is married by chance. Show of hands, anyone married? Okay, so that crowd is a no-go. I have to scratch that out on my notes. Um, <laughs> get there. But um, how many of y'all are interested in a relationship or are currently in a relationship? By, just by show of hands. Interested in a relationship. Like, like want to get into a relationship. Yeah. Okay, some of us, some of us are. Uh, I mean, if, if you are in a relationship and you don't have your hand raised, that's an issue. <laughs> and we can talk about that afterwards. But Sorry. hopefully, hopefully if you are dating right now, you're interested in the other person. Otherwise, y'all need to have that conversation. So, we have singles in here. All right, great. Now I know where to go. Um... Now, there's some ideas, there's, there's really six ideas that I thought the world has been pushing heavily on us, and ideas we need to wrap our minds around tonight, even if we don't hold to those ideas. So, those six ideas uh, are as follows. One is one idea that the culture pushes on us, and it's, I need to find out if we are sexually compatible, and I need to go and get myself involved in this. That's one idea. Another idea is I need to live with him or her in order to find out if we are compatible. And this is also known as cohabitation. All right, third, I feel the, I feel the pressure in the room right now. Third, <laughs> I need someone to complete me. As the Jerry Maguire movie says, you complete me. You, if you haven't seen the movie, it's okay. <laughs> Fourth, is this idea that I just talked about but it goes by this hashtag statement, and that is, love wins. Um, fifth point is, I won't find anyone better, and I'm running out of time. Those are kind of simultaneously at work. Uh, the sixth idea is, why am I still single? There has to be something wrong with me. And some of y'all might think that. Some of, some of y'all may resonate with that, or some of y'all might say, uh, I don't know. Are you, are you sure something's not wrong with me, Matt? Well, I can't say that for certain. I haven't gotten <laughs> totally joking. Totally joking. But let's, let's take all those ideas, and I want to expound upon those and see if what God has to say is how your life lines up with those things. So, all right, our first point was I need to find out if we're sexually compatible, this idea that I have to test the waters. And this idea, first off, is focused on oneself. You may think that 
you're trying this out because you really care for the other person. But if you care for the other person, you just wait. God grows us in every single way. If you've been in a relationship or you're currently in a relationship, you know that over the course of time, God has, or he'll break it off, God has grown you both emotionally, both uh, spiritually in some way, um, both with communication, which is always tough. <laughs> communication between man and woman is like speaking two different languages at times. <laughs> and uh, I was joking with the guys earlier that we need a man translator sometimes. Uh, <laughs> Like, I, I'm digging myself a hole. I'm going to get out of this. So, let me, let me explain. I'm going to have to, just, just give me that look and I'll know. Um, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. If you have a Bible, let us read God's word and see what he has to say. And many of you have heard this verse before, but it's always good to go back to. Ephesians 5, 25. It says, husbands love your wives as Christ loves the church and gave himself up for her. Okay, I'm going to stop there. Now, we see and hear about this kind of love, and Paul talks about this love um, not only here but in other places. Uh, in fact, he, I think he mentions this again in another spot in one of his letters, uh, to love to love his wife. I mean, for husbands to love their wives. And what's interesting, if you study the word love here, and you've probably heard um, the other tense of this verb, the word here is agapeo, which is another, uh, which is the uh, verb tense of the word you probably know as agape love. Now, agape love means to seek the highest good for the other person. Think about that. To seek the highest good for the other person. So you're not self-concerned. You're not trying to pick somebody that meshes with you as much as you're asking God, are we called to be together to serve and love and grow each other? And that's where we get things wrong in our world, is we try to find somebody to fit me. And I don't think that's completely wrong, but I think we're asking the wrong question first. The right question is, God, who out there can sharpen me? Who can help me be more like you? And who can I help bring alongside and serve equally, not lording over, not the guy lording over his wife, but equally loving and care, caring for her, likewise he with him. And uh, this, this idea is huge. When you think about someone who is asking themselves, you know, how will I know if we're compatible? And I don't mean to like be uh, derogatory here, but how do I know if we're compatible in bed if we don't try things out? How do I know? But this whole idea of sex before marriage is not primarily about the other person. It's primarily about their self. It's, it's selfish. There's no way around it. Sex prior to marriage is selfish and a self-serving act. Now, let's not get things wrong. Sex is a beautiful thing. Sex is something God created. And I was telling Molly about this um, before I got here, that when the day comes, when the day happens, when we get married and the honeymoon um, takes place, the, the word that should pop in your mind is, Finally! Finally we're here! Finally this is happening! And that should be the excitement leading up to marriage. Now, if you've been in relationships, or you've shared your heart and your body and your life with somebody else before, that doesn't mean you're too far from being redeemed. Remember that. I think sometimes uh, pastors will guilt trip people and say, don't you want to save yourself and save all yourself for somebody? Yeah, we do. But what about me? I've already, I've already shared myself with someone. What do I do then? God is a God of redemption. That's why he sent Jesus for us, to redeem us back to where he wanted us to be. You're not too far from redemption. So know that. So that day comes, and maybe you have been in a tough spot like that. 
and you have given yourself a little bit away, or you've given much of yourself away, just know that God loves you, and God's also a God of grace. And, and, and be, be encouraged by that. And so, one of the examples that came to my mind when I was thinking about destroying this idea of testing the waters prior to marriage was um, thinking about building a model plane. Has anybody built a model plane or built something, or maybe even just a puzzle? Just a puzzle, okay? Legos, you know, puzzles. Yeah. Model planes, that's for certain <laughs> folks. Huh? So I mess with Legos. Okay, that works. <laughs> I don't know if it'll work for this example. All right. But um, I was just thinking about this. If, if you know uh, somebody that's built model planes before, um, one of the last things they do before they finish the model plane is they'll glue it together. Now, why do I say that? When we have sex prior to marriage, we are taking the final act that seals the deal and trying to take it first. You would never take this model plane out of the box. I keep picking this up. You would never take the model plane out of the box, and the first thing you do would try to glue the pieces. You would never do that. That's the final piece in completing the work of art. And I think that's, it's, it's somewhat symbolic, in a way, of the final piece of marriage that God brings us together in physical union with somebody. And at last, finally, we are one. So, um, the second idea that I brought up here is this idea of cohabitation. And there's some similarities with cohabitation and testing the water sexually prior to marriage. And that is this. When, if or when, someone tries to start living with someone, they're on a slippery slope towards wanting to test the waters and go back to point number one. The temptation is so, so deep. Because you're always with that person, always engaging in, in, in emotional conversation. The temptation so high. No one else is around. If God has made this person for me, then what's the point of waiting any longer? I love them, and I want to demonstrate that love. And that's where, this, that's where the devil lies to you. And that's how he deceives you. He takes something bad and makes it sound good. He takes the lie and makes it sound like truth. That's deception. And this, again, even just simply living with somebody, is not necessarily a sin, but it starts leading towards selfish and self-centered motives. And the motives of living together, just like the first point, they're selfish. They're selfish. This goes back, to again, to Ephesians 5.25 and examining love. Is the love that you're demonstrating towards someone else love that is seeking the highest good for the other person? Is the love that you're demonstrating seeking the highest good for the other person? There's many, there's many women that, I've, that I have uh, heard stories of in their relationships about they fall in love with somebody and he treats them well, he cares for them, he provides for them, but they're not married. And she grows emotionally attached to him. And the day comes when they break up. And she suffers and hurts and cries and still has that attachment. Even if a man doesn't engage sexually with a woman and they're living together, they're emotionally attached and it's hard for them to break away. It's tough for them to break away. There's, there's something um, that I'd, I'd heard a song on the radio, and uh, you're probably familiar with it. John Legend wrote a song called All of Me. Familiar with the song? Hopefully I'm not going to get it stuck in your head for the rest of the talk. But there's a line in there where he says, uh, he, he talks about loving one's perfect imperfections. And I, th I think that's, those are some beautiful words, although they're, they're very different from each other. You have perfect and then you have imperfect. So how do, those, how do those work together? Well, think about this. If you are loving somebody, if you are uh, seeking the highest good for that person, you don't see imperfections and try to fix them. A lot of people try to do that. 
You don't see those imperfections and try to fix them. You let God work on that person's heart. And what's awesome about God working on someone's heart is this, is that in any relationship, there's always going to be imperfections. But you know what? Jesus loves us despite our imperfections. He loves us despite all the things that we think about ourselves that we wish we could fix. If you were perfect, would you feel like you needed the love of anyone? Would you feel like you needed the love of God? No, there's a reason why we're not instantly redeemed. As soon as we get saved, we don't get uh, raptured up to heaven. But God works on us to make us more and more into the image of Christ. So we see our great need for Him. His love for us doesn't get any weaker when we see all the things that we lack, but it moves us closer to Him. And because we realize this, we realize we come short of our of perfection. We are drawn near to the one whose image we were made in. It's, it's that perfect imperfection. God, even though no, he, he knows this state that we're in right now is not perfect, He is drawing us near to Himself because we realize our desperate need, perfectly imperfect. <laughs> we're in a state of imperfection. But God loves us just the same. So, third point here is this idea of completing somebody. So, why can't somebody complete me? I thought that was why we got married, was so somebody else could complete me. No man or woman is perfect. We, we just said that. No one's going to complete you. We are insufficient in our spirituality, our physical looks, our features, any of that. Um, and socially and also psychologically, we cannot provide all someone's needs. That's, why we, that's one of the reasons why we have community. Because there's other parts of the body called to sharpen one another. And when we get away from that, we get away from God's purpose and God's calling. Um, and I've had to learn this over the course of the past eight years. I've, I've really, really been blessed um, that God brought Molly to me because I, I, was, I was getting nowhere fast. <laughs> I was, from high school, dating to always fill a void. At 17, I thought something was lacking in my life, and so I thought, well, I should just pursue a relationship, and maybe that'll fix things. And I tried to date a girl that went to church, and that didn't work, and so um, she never answered my call, and I was like, you know what, forget the church girls, I'm going to go after the world. I'm going to go after somebody that's like me. I'm going to go after someone who uh, looks like me, maybe talks like me, maybe acts like me. And you know what? I'm going to look for that person. And I found that person. And wow, I, God humbled me in so many ways. And yet I still didn't learn. And I went to date somebody else. And that fell apart. And every time I dated, the relationships got shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter. Until I just felt like God was saying, hey, don't you get it? You need to wait. You need to chill. You need to stop thinking somebody's going to complete you. You need to be still and know that I'm God. And I have this under control. And you're out there trying to run around. And at one point I was even going to churches, scanning the room to see if there was anybody <laughs> cute. And then I would say, you know what? Nope. I'm going to go to another church. And so I was church hopping. And the people would tell me, like, hey, are you looking for a church? Yeah, you know, I just want to find a community. And in the back of my head, I was like, I'm, I'm really looking for a cute girl. And God stopped me. And I got some guys that came around me and started holding me accountable and started asking me the tough questions and started saying, hey, man, what's your thought life like? What's your heart like? Are you in your word? How is your relationship with God? Are you talking to him? And is he talking to you through his word? What's, what's going on there? And I realized that my life wasn't about finding something for me, but was about giving myself away and serving God. It wasn't about finding something for me. It was about giving myself away. And from that point, there's that, that year, God was just shouting loudly this one word, and it was to serve. Just serve. Then the next year, God gave me another word that was just the word for the year, if you will. 
And it was selfless. How can you be selfless? And God was building upon that and helping to humble me. Because I had this, I had this void I thought I could fill with somebody. Some of the things that I learned over the course of making some stupid mistakes uh, was this. I, at first, I began to think bigger about life than my own little dreams. I began to think bigger about life. Second, I realized my anxiety for uh, wondering what was the next big thing in life was not a huge concern any longer. I was always waiting for the next big thing to happen. And God said, hey, I got this under control. You can't add a day to your life by worrying. I feed the birds. Aren't you of more, of more value than that? Yeah, you are. You're, you're made in my image. And I want you to be like me. I want you to serve. And I want you to preach the gospel to people you come across. And I, I realized that as I was serving, God would, if I was meant to be married, he would bring someone alongside me. And I wouldn't have to spend my time surveying churches to see if I could find some cute girl in the crowd. The... the, the um, the, the fourth thing is that most importantly, I realized that what I realized what it meant to be the church. I realized what it meant to worship God. I realized what it meant to be missional. And I, I, I found that God wasn't concerned with my church attendance, and He wasn't concerned concerned with uh, taking um, millions of pictures with um, you know little African children and posting up on my Facebook to look like I was serving. It, 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 it's about more than just going overseas to look good or more than just going to a soup kitchen to serve people. It was more than that. It was every single day a part of my life. And it wasn't just Sunday. It was Monday. It was Tuesday. It was Wednesday. It was Thursday, Friday, Saturday. All throughout the week. Being the church, not just going to the church. Now... There was a lot of humbling that went on, and I'm, I'm, so, I'm so thankful for it. And all the heartache and the tough times, and even the stints of depression at times, I'm, I'm glad those things happened. Because as a result, God has grown me. You think about any discipline out there. Any discipline, like if you're training for a sport, or if you're training for a marathon, or if you're going to the gym, or if it's studying, those long nights of study, all those disciplines, although they're tough in the moment, at the end, they produce fruit, and as a result, you reap the fruit that you have put work into. And I wouldn't trade those tough times for the world, because a lot of times I get to share my story, and God uses that. Now, the fourth thing that we talked about was this idea of love wins. I know you're just ready for me to talk about that, aren't you? So, love wins. Um, there's, there's this idea that's, that's been going on for probably the past six months or so, and there's been a lot of press about it. And I'm sure, just like I do, many of y'all... Uh, have some friends that might be in that area where they, they really believe they are loving somebody. But, again, I, I want to destroy this idea that it is love that's going on there. I want to destroy this idea that it is love going on there. Uh, and, and I want to be gentle about it, but at the same time, I want you to realize God's heart in it. That He loves you, but He doesn't he doesn't want to leave any of us with this mentality that we're loving by encouraging a lifestyle in such a way. Um, so the, if, if you follow the news, the, what's called the LGBT community and supporters um, have rallied around this idea that love wins. And if you oppose this idea, you're basically a big... You can't say anything against them or even throw out questions because by doing that, you are self-centered, a Bible thumper, and you need to get with the 21st century. You're, you're off into the old ways. You're off into the old ways of doing things. But when I look at Scripture and I look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 through 28, 
I realized that God was made in man's image. Male and female, he created them. Did I say something wrong? Oh, okay. You say God was made in man's image. Oh my gosh, I'm glad you made that face. (laughs) Man was made in God's image. Oh, kick him out of here. (laughs) Man was made in God's image. Male and female, he created them. Is that right? There it is. There you go. All right. Ooh. Man, that's almost been a doozy. Yeah. <laughs> so God made them different. I, I, I was listening to some studies this past week, and uh, there, there's some psychologists that did some tests, and they put little girls and little boys in a room, and all they put in the room was a bunch of chairs, some crayons, and some paper. All right. Can you guess what the little girls did? Here's what they did. They circled up their chair. They started talking to each other. They grabbed the crayons, and guess what they drew? They drew little kittens, flowers, people with smiling faces. Now, guess what the boys drew? They put their chairs in a line, side by side, not looking at each other, not talking, but started drawing airplanes and things exploding and war tanks. Okay, that's, that's just how they are. That's just how they're going to operate. And the, and the boys not only did this, but they started to say, hey, I bet we could climb up that. I bet you that you could, you could, uh, you could break that if you tried. And I bet you I could burp the loudest. And there's obviously a difference even at an early age between boys and girls. We know God has made us different. God has made us different even from the get-go. And we're equally made um, in God's image, not him and ours, but in his, and we are to be image bearers. There's no more important identity than, being, uh, than knowing that you are an image bearer made in his image. Everything you do should operate off of that idea. When you think about who you are, often we will say, well, I'm a student, something I do, study, go to school pay for uh, really expensive um, fees every semester, and uh, I study a lot, and, you know, maybe I like basketball, so I, I watch basketball, I play basketball. Those are things I do. Now, part of our identity is what we do, but that doesn't really get to the heart of who we are. We are image bearers made in His image, and we operate off of that, and we reflect Him, and because of who he's called us to be, and because of who we are, we are to bear his image on the earth according to God. Not according to man, but according to God. Now, when this phrase, love wins, was coined, it was very strategically coined. Think about it. Love. Who would defy love? Who would be opposed to love? Who would be against love? Why would anyone be against love? And winning. Winning is awesome. Just like what's-his-name uh, was known for. Um, who's the guy that says winning? Uh, winning. Uh, Charlie Sheen. Charlie Sheen. Yeah. Who would be against winning? Of course people want to win. People want to be victorious. So these two words were strategically put together and used as this poster for the gay rights movement. Now, uh, when you study what love is in this relationship... It's this idea that there's ultimate freedom to do as I please. That's what's communicated, right? Love is to do as I please. It's I, you, you don't have the right to tell me what I want to do. This is my body. I'm going to do with it whatever I want to do, and I'm going to love whoever I want to love. But that's not love. It's ultimate freedom to do as I please, and you can't tell me no. This is not love. It's like saying when Adam and Eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that love won. They had ultimate freedom to do as they pleased, and they chose what their heart desired. Is that love winning? No. Sin came into the world because of that. Because of that, sin has been passed down generation to generation. And I was listening to um, when when the president gave, uh, and he addressed... Uh, the, the turnover, the court decision for marriage to be recognized in all 50 states. 
one of the things that he said was that we are one step closer to perfection now that gay marriage has been accepted. We are one step closer to perfection. I kid you not, you can go on YouTube and listen to this talk. He said we're one step closer to perfection. We know as believers in here, there's no way this life is ever going to be perfect. No way. It hasn't been for thousands of years. What makes us think that we can somehow climb the ladder and make things perfect? There's no way. And what's also really interesting is when you study the the movement, this Love Wins movement, you'll notice this, that it paints a picture of accepting um, any accepting their belief, whether you like it or not, um, it compares itself to the civil rights movement of the 60s while aligning itself to the country's belief in freedom for all people. Not only this, but it distorts what's really going on in the hearts of many of these men and women who are struggling, who are hurting, who need someone to talk to rather than to, than to be pushed out of our churches. They need love. They really do. And love does win when it's Christ's love that shines through. But the love of man leads to our sin. It leads to all evil desires. The scriptures say that our heart is deceitful. (laughs) What makes us think that our understanding of love is going to make things perfect or make make things better or improve the state of our country? The fifth idea was was this... Um, is this idea of running out of time. Um, you know, I, I put it here, I, I won't find anyone better and I'm running out of time. This, this thought that, you know, the clock's ticking and I haven't found anybody yet. What's going on, God? God, am I supposed to be single the rest of my life? What's, what's happening? Well, is, is, this, is this a good and God, godly thing that we should try to go and find somebody? Should we? I mean, should we pursue this? Or do we wait on the Lord? So if you're asking that question, God, what, what do I do? What, what should I do? And there's not a- anything explicitly in the scriptures that say, you know, if you're a woman, just wait around and a guy will ask you out on a date. Or uh, for the guy, it's like, well, you know, Proverbs 31 woman, you want to go find that girl, uh, just, just go find him. You'll find him somewhere. Just keep asking. Keep praying. Ask the Holy Spirit. And again, go back to where we started. Don't ask who's going to fill that void in my life, but how can someone come alongside me and we sharpen each other and be more like Jesus? Because that's the goal in marriage, is to be more like Jesus, to be one together pursuing Christ. All right, last thing that I want to destroy the idea about, and that is, is there something wrong with me because I'm single right now? Is something wrong with me? What am I doing wrong? What's happening? Is there something I'm not doing right? God, help me out. Matt, can you give me some advice? Can you give me like 10 points and uh, I can follow those and maybe, you know, things will work out better? Well, l- let me share this with you. Um, look real quick with me at Genesis 2, verse 18. And I want us to examine this first because I've only heard it one way being preached. But there's more to it than just the one way you've probably heard it as well. Genesis 2, 18 says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now, you've probably read this before, and you've heard this interpretation. I think it's bigger than this, but you've heard this interpretation that man is not meant to be alone, therefore God created a woman. And that's it. Right? God also created a woman because he wanted to multiply image bearers. If you go back to chapter 1 and look at verse 27, it says, So God created man in his own image, and in the image of God he created them. Male and female, he created them. And verse 28 it says, And God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish and sea and the birds of the heavens and every living thing that moves on the earth. And so God has given man community. Because he says, be fruitful and multiply. So when you look at Genesis 2.18 and see that says, well, you know, hey, here's, here's a woman for you. It's bigger than that. It's God has given a woman for you so that you may have community. It's, and that's a huge idea. Why is that a huge idea? Because what happens to the single person who God has given the gift of singleness to? 
are they to read this and feel like God has placed a curse on them? That's, that's important. If you look at 1 Corinthians 7, 8, Paul says to the unmarried and the widow, it is good to remain single as I am. So are these in contradiction with each other? No, because Genesis 2.18 is bigger than just God has created a woman to be his helper, but it is that God has created a woman to be his helper and to create image bearers, to multiply children, and to pour into them and to create community. That's the big idea. That's the big idea here. So for the single person, be in community. For the married person, be in community. For the person that's dating, be in community. Don't be a rogue Christian out there having your own little podcast time and that's your pastor and you do your own little worship time and that's your time to, to congregate with everybody else and worship God. It's bigger than that. God wants us to worship together, not to forsake the community of believers like the book of Hebrews says. So, man needs community and God is a communal God. We were made in His image. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Before anything was created, God was a communal God. Father, Son, Holy Spirit interacting with each other. Made in His image. We are made for community. We are made to be like Him. And to be more like Him, we have to be involved in community. And we see here that marriage is an amazing gift. Marriage not only blesses you, but blesses everyone around you. And you may ask that question, well, okay, Matt, that's all good, but how do I know if I'm supposed to be married or not? And I've been asked that a couple times, and here's really what Scripture says about it, and it might be a surprise to you. 1 Corinthians 7, 9, Paul says this, but if they cannot exercise self-control, they should get married. <laughs> For it's better to marry than to burn with passion. Now, for any of y'all that missed that and what that was all about is, if you desire to have sex, get married. That's what Paul's saying. If that is not a big deal to you, and you're like, hey, I'm just content being me, you might want to ask that question. God, have you called me to a life of singleness? And how can I use that for your kingdom? If you have that desire, that's really the kicker. <laughs> that's, that's all I can say about that. I could give you a laundry list of other stuff, but that's really the key. I know it may not sound very romantic, but that's, that's life. Life's not always pretty, but that's the key. That's awkward, right? So, <laughs> transitioning from that into why I believe one plus one equals one. So first, God desires us to be one with our spouse. And because God desires that, and my allegiance is to Him, I want to obey Him. There's a desire. I'm not under compulsion. I want to obey Him. And that's part of being a follower of Christ. If you... If you want to serve God, that's a sure indication that you have the Holy Spirit living inside you. You're a new creation. You want to serve God. But if you don't want to serve God, and you, you go to church begrudgingly, and you really you re really wrestle with that, I, I would ask that question, God, am, am I one of your children? If you don't want to serve God, you may not be one of his children. And I say that in love tonight. I don't, I don't say that to reach fire and brimstone, and hey, you're going to hell if you, if you don't repent and turn from your sins. No, that's, I, I, I say that in love. I say that in love. He saves me from my own eternal road to hell. He saves me, and my life is in his hands. My life is in his hands regardless if I give it to him or not. So why fight against him? Either way, God has me. But the question is, do I want to be in His grace, in His love, or be separate from Him, in His wrath for what I deserve? Grace we don't deserve. We don't deserve to be with Him eternally. That's, that's grace. Second, 
Being one points so perfectly to God. God is a communal God, like we just discussed, and He is three persons in one being, fully in agreement with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Neither of them trying to lord over each other or be greater than each other, but all equally loving. And that is the same for us in marriage. As communal people who are made in God's image, we're to equally love one another, not lord over each other. Being one, just as God is one. Third point, being one also includes being one with God in our marriage. You, have a, you essentially have a Trinitarian relationship. What I mean by that is you have husband, wife, and God. Just like God has really said, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Fourth is the fact that it's so much more freeing to be one and to serve each other instead of being opposed to each other and always trying to satisfy each other. And fifth and last point is it's not going to work any other way. It's not going to work any other way. If you try to operate as two individuals in marriage, it's not going to work. Being one together is God's purpose and the best way for us to operate in marriage. So what are we called to? What, what are we taking away from tonight? And I'm eliminating the, uh, the idea of being married in the room, if anyone's married, so that's cut from the talk. But I want to address those of us who are single, um, wondering about our singleness, and those of us in relationships. So, for someone who's single that's in the room tonight, I want you to consider this. One of the things that Paul says is that if you are married, part of your life is going to be focused on trying to please your spouse. And you'll be divided. One of the blessings of singleness is the fact that you're not divided and you can make much of your time for the purpose of God's kingdom. On a Friday night, you, you're going out, you're ministering to, you're being with, you're discipling and pouring into those people around you that God's called you to. To someone who is thinking about entering into a dating relationship or is currently in a dating relationship, just know that at the end of the road, the goal is to seek marriage. So if you're dating to date, if you're dating just to see what happens, if you're dating with not, with not having the purpose and intent Uh, of seeking one another out for the point of being married, then you really need to have that talk. You really need to have that talk. And the last thing, and my fiancé here doesn't know I'm going to share this, but I want to read something that she wrote. Oh, gosh. And I've been really (laughs) encouraged. A lot of young women as well, as well as a lot of men out there. So here's what she wrote. She posted this on Facebook not too long ago. Don't worry, it's not anything. Oh my that, god. Yeah, you know, it's public. You know? <laughs> okay. So she so wrote this. I feel really called to share my belief on this. Please understand my heart's intention. Matt is not, that's me, Matt. Matt is not my everything. He's not my first love, my life, my joy, my sufficiency, my world. My reason for living, my medicine for a sad day, or my soul's need. God is not the... Uh, whoa. <laughs> I'm going to say that again. <laughs> Starting over. Matt is not the holder of my heart. But understand, I do love this man. And I love you too. <laughs> With all the ability God has given me to love. But Matt is this, my gift... God has given me an incredible gift, and I will cherish him as my gift for the rest of our lives together. I will love and serve this gift with all that I have, but there is only one that can completely satisfy my heart, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. What freedom there is in this. Matt does not have to be perfect for me because God is my perfection. Matt does not have to supply my heart's needs of joy and peace, laughter and fun, because Jesus does that. Matt's going to fail me. He will hurt me, and I'll do the same, hopefully not ever intentionally. But the Lord will never fail me. He will never leave me, nor will he forsake me. 
I've seen and heard so many women and men longing for boyfriends and husbands, thinking that once he or she finally comes, they'll be satisfied and life is set. Please be careful. This is a huge lie from Satan. This person will never satisfy you, even in marriage. So set yourself free and understand that your spouse, girlfriend, boyfriend, was not created to be your everything. God has blessed us with marriage as a gift to be holy and pure and glorifying Him. But never was it made to replace God. God is your everything, whether you know it or not, or believe it or not. Now there's so much more freedom and joy uh, to love Matt and to be with him because he's not my God, thank God. And I'm not his, thank God. (laughs) Nevertheless, I'm overly stoked and thankful to be marrying this man of God who will never step in the place of my everything. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether throne or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. That's Colossians 1, 15-16. And all that I've shared tonight is worth nothing if Jesus is not the one you're seeking first. Even before you seek out 